Happy spring! Today on Tree Talk we are going to discuss a tree that is just a sure sign of spring here in our eastern forest, flowering dogwood, uh, Cornus Florida. Um, so, uh, it is early May where we are here in the eastern panhandle of uh, West Virginia. Um, uh, flowering dogwood will start to flower kind of earlier in April in the south, uh, the southeastern part of its range, which is kind of mostly sort of the eastern forests of, the, of North America. Um, up here, you know, Pennsylvania, a little bit further north, it kind of flowers late April, early May. To me, I associate it with, you know, we are fully now firmly in spring when our dogwood is flowering. So let's go ahead and start with the flowers, which are kind of the m sort of most famous part, um, uh, the most famous piece of this species. So you can see here, the flowers are actually, we would associate these big, round, showy, you know, white, petals, quote unquote petals, with the dogwood flower. But if you look closely, this is actually a compound flower. So this is actually modified leaf tissue. These sort of, these white, you know, again, not petals. Um, they are called bracts. Um, what they are is modified leaf tissue. Um, that is, you know, helping attract pollinators to this species. But if you look very closely, you see these very tiny little tube-shaped yellow flowers. So every single one of those is its own individual flower. When it gets pollinated, it will develop into a red, kind of football-shaped uh, droop fruit. Um, have a kind of a waxy coating, hard seed on the inside. Um, and so, yeah, this is a compound flower. Um, now this is the state flower of Virginia, state tree of Virginia as well, um, but it's kind of a compound flower. It's not just one flower. So there we go. There's a little fun fact for you that these petals are uh, not petals, they're leaf tissue. Um, and then the petals are actually uh, fused. You can see, again, they are there on those small little yellow flowers. So not as showy as the entire, you know, compound flower. So great way to identify dogwood outside of the um, flowering season um, is it has uh, opposite leaves. Um, so we can see here opposite branching pattern and opposite leaves. So at every node of growth, we have two branches coming out and they come opposite of each other. Same with the leaf tissue. Um, also, the best way to identify a dogwood is by its bark. Uh, so on older um, trees, the bark gets very uh, cobblestone. Um, textured, and we can kind of see that at the base of this young one. This guy's not very big here. Um, this tree gets about uh, maybe, you know, 30, 35 feet tall, kind of at, at its height. Usually is a little bit more towards, you know, 15, 20, 25 feet tall or so. Um, it is usually found on sort of the edges of forest. It likes um, light shade, um, sort of moderate shade. Um, so it's kind of an edge specialist or a canopy gap specialist where it will occupy the understory. Um, in the understory, it does fill a really important role. It feeds a lot of birds. Um, so those, you know, those fruits um, that will develop into the autumn and turn red, uh, they are very important for a lot of migrating birds. They have a lot of um, a good nutrition in there as birds are migrating south for the winter. Um, uh, so really important for that. They also are hosts for many uh, um, moth species, Lepidopteran species, um, including our Cecropias um, and other kind of really, you know, um, fanciful moths. Um, I also don't know, you know, the veracity of this, but I learned in my college dendrology class that underneath flowering dogwood, you'll find some of the highest snail diversity in the entire forest because dogwood is good at sequestering uh, calcium out of the soil, at taking up calcium in the soil. And then when the leaves fall, it deposits calcium onto the surface and snails can eat that and use that in their shells. So just a really cool example of how ecosystems are, you know, incredibly complicated and complex and um, ever winding uh, without us even really knowing um, what's going on in them. So flowering dogwood, um, it, it is mostly used as a landscaping species. And that is why I am certain that you know this species. Um, if you are in, you know, the Eastern US, I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, the natural uh, color of those flowers, those compound flowers is this white color, um, but they have been bred to be kind of pinkish. And so in an urban setting, you'll sometimes see those white flowers, you'll see pink flowers, um, you'll see both. Um, they are really, really lovely, wonderful landscape species. And I am just so grateful that we have, you know, one of the top, you know, landscaping spring blooming small tree species is a native rather than something like, you know, a Bradford pear or those weeping cherries or all this other stuff that's not native. At least this is um, feeding our native insects, native birds, um, contributing to an urban forest ecosystem, whereas those other ones are kind of just, you know, taking up space. Um, so beyond that, you know, not a lot of commercial use because again, the tree doesn't get very big. You know, one of the biggest ones I've ever seen has maybe only been, you know, 
five inches, six inches in diameter, and that's quite large, you know, for uh, a flowering dogwood. Um, but it has been used, you know, uh, traditionally for uh, for other things. The wood is super, super, super hard. So things that needed really hard wood, you know, it was kind of used for small things that needed hard wood. Um, there was also some medicinal features. I've read before that Native Americans used it, uh, the bark for some anti-malarial properties, things like that. But there you have it, flowering dogwood. What a wonderful uh, showy sp spring species, um, uh, wonderful member of our forest understories.